story nine of lanagan amateur detective by edward h hurlbut this librivox recording is in the public domain story nine the dominant strain samson said lanagan there's something queer about that robbins case professional second-story men aren't returning to the scene of a ten thousand dollar burglary and sending by messenger a written proposition to return the property for a cash settlement they know how and where to negotiate the stuff and they take no chances particularly not with one of their number under arrest assuming the ward boy is one of them and that is another queer angle seasoned crooks don't operate with sixteen-year-old boys how do you account for the ring found on him i don't yet what's your theory haven't any but ten second-story cases in three months in one district winding up with a ten thousand dollar job is against all form dig into it then here see who this is as you go out maybe about the suspect same name he handed lanagan a visitor's card scrawled across it in a nervous hand was jenny ward important in the anteroom a girl with a crutch arose to meet him but he motioned her back to her seat she had the pinched face and the wistful sadness of those condemned to life but half whole it was evident before she spoke a dozen words that she came as so many others come to the newspaper anteroom in futile uncomprehending protest at the entire system of news it was her brother jimmy who was under arrest and she said he was innocent jimmy told her he found the ring therefore he did find it because jimmy never told her a lie she did not see why papers should print such things even if he had been arrested and why they did not try to prove a boy innocent rather than aid the police in trying to prove him guilty lanagan listened patiently at first with an occasional question and then he listened with a deepening interest as the girl's fervour grew it is only the rich whose wrongs you right she exclaimed at last passionately what rights have we poor i cannot afford even a lawyer mamma does washing she is old and timid and she was afraid to come to the papers i mostly educated myself sir i had to i have learned the piano at the sunday school i have a little class of pupils there the teacher helps me get them i just teach the first lessons you know i make four dollars and twenty-five cents a week mamma makes about seven dollars when she is not sick jimmy has been making eight dollars with a raise to nine dollars and fifty cents coming the first so you see we manage to make out all of us together and send my three little brothers to school and now now all the people on the street are talking about us and my little brothers won't go to school the others call them names everyone saw jimmy's picture in your paper today won't you please help us we haven't any men folks to fight for us now with jimmy locked up please sir help us get jimmy out i went to police headquarters and waited hours and hours to see jimmy and then and then finally to the detectives they took me and said i would see jimmy but they took me to a room and shut the door and they swore at me they said i better tell everything or go to jail why why they talked like i knew about the robbery and they were going to arrest me she fainted just dropped quietly back into the chair wearily hopelessly woefully without so much as a sigh lanagan breathed quickly as he ministered to her poor little sis he said softly plucky little mother of the tenements taking a full-grown man's place but what a handicap her eyes opened oh she fluttered her thin sensitive lips quivering in apology i, I fainted d didn't i how queer i never fainted before i cannot afford to give way like that sometimes though oh sometimes i wish i could i wanted to in front of the detectives my brain whirled and whirled and whirled with fire like pinwheels but i wouldn't i wouldn't give them the satisfaction her slight hands with their long fingers clenched her eyes sparkled harrigan that is his name he was the worst the brute oh if i were a man i would kill him for what he said to me never mind harrigan leave him to me said lanagan you are only exciting yourself 
go home now and try not to worry we are going to look into your brother's case oh thank you she said with shining eyes there were at no time any tears she had been trained in a life where tears are inadequate lanagan watched her as she hobbled on her one crutch down the hall to the elevator her useless limb swinging loosely she was a pathetic little figure with her man's brain her grown woman's pride and her little misshapen body a fourteen-year-old girl wearing long clothes in grim earnest a quick pang shot through him cripples always saddened him they have infinitely so much less than the meanest wastrel who has health the judgment of a cold-blooded detective against the judgment of a loyal sister mused lanagan which is it an hour's study at police headquarters of the reports on all ten of the burglaries established in lanagan's mind one settled conviction they were all committed by the same author and whoever it was whether an individual or a gang had first become reasonably familiar with the interior arrangements of the houses entered and with the daily routine of the households in the robbins case for instance from the time the last member of the household left the bedrooms or second floor to go down to the dining-room on the first floor for dinner until a member of the household returning upstairs found the evidences of the burglary only twenty-five minutes had passed and yet in that time the thief or thieves had entered the house and had left it after cleanly ransacking three bedrooms an open bathroom window and the drain pipe to the ground gave mute evidence of the burglar's route in all of the cases only precious stones were taken nothing monogrammed was touched nor watches silverware trinkets or bric-a-brac but this was of no particular consequence the average expert thief prefers the precious stones removed from their settings they are difficult to identify and easy to negotiate professional work all of it muttered lanagan arguing to himself but what about that message the extraordinary boldness that had marked all the crimes culminated in the robbins case when a man with smoked glasses heavy moustache soft hat pulled down and ulster turned up gave a small boy ten cents to carry an envelope to the robbins home but a block from where the man stood enclosed in the message which offered to return the jewelry for five thousand dollars cash was a brooch that had been among the articles stolen it was sent as proof that the offer was genuine the message said the police were not to be notified if the family desired to negotiate they were to send the boy back with the single word yes and they would be communicated with later in the excitement of receiving the message under such singular circumstances a member of the family forgetting or disregarding the caution telephoned the police holding the boy in the house the police misunderstood the call and a patrol wagon load of reserves clattered up to the door within ten minutes under the impression murder was being done naturally the man on the corner had ample time to escape no further offers to negotiate came to the family on the second day the police placed under arrest the ward boy he was employed as a helper with the phoenix vacuum cleaning company which had been engaged a few days before at the robbins home and at the start he made a bad case superficially by his contradictions reflected lanagan reviewing the case in their investigations the detectives examining the two men and the helper jimmy ward who had operated the cleaning apparatus at the robbins house learned that the boy had been noticed that morning examining a diamond ring asked where he got it he had replied he found it on the floor of the washroom at the establishment no one claimed the ring the matter was called to the attention of cutting the proprietor and manager of the company but he knew of no customer having reported such a loss the detectives harrigan and thomas took the boy to headquarters for further questioning and he had there said he found the ring on the sidewalk on that contradiction he was placed under arrest and locked up in detinue 
further the police regard as damaging the fact that a robbery a week previous had been committed in the same neighbourhood in a home where the cleaning apparatus had been engaged the ward boy serving as the helper in that house also he had worked with a different crew of men than had been on the robbins house and this fact in the police theory eliminated the remaining employees of the company as it was highly improbable that they were all in a second-story ring they redoubled their efforts to find the supposed connections of ward on the theory that he operated with an outside gang jimmy said he found the ring and if he said he found it he did find it said lanagan repeating the sister's earnest declaration well for her sake i hope he did hour after hour lanagan tirelessly kept at his rounds visiting in turn each of the ten homes in the western edition that had been robbed during the last three months long before he reached the robbins home the last of the ten he had formed his startling theory in nine of the cases he had discovered that which he set out in search of a constant condition present in them all there was just one question that he wanted to ask at the robbins home he found the home in a flurry of excitement police headquarters had rung up and asked that a member of the household come at once to the detective bureau to identify if possible a bracelet that it was believed had been among the stolen articles and that had been recovered lanagan arriving just as the senior robbins was leaving in his automobile was invited to accompany him he did so but first he had asked and had answered the one question he came to ask in the office of o'rourke night captain of detectives they found o'rourke harrigan and thomas grouped around a woman huddled down in a chair lanagan caught a low sob a helpless forlorn frightened sob that sent a curious sensation of nausea through him he stepped quickly forward to gaze down upon the misery-racked form of the cripple jenny ward i don't know anything oh, i don't know anything she wailed i found it on the doorstep o'rourke had turned as they entered he stepped to his own desk holding the bracelet toward robin's that is my daughter's bracelet sirs robin said it was my christmas present to her harrigan listening nodded in satisfaction i knew it he said i guess we had better throw the little gutter snipe in cap a little pressure now and she's bound to squeal oh oh, oh. sobs were shuddering from the girl squeal you damned clodhopper give her a bullet and kill her now if you're trying to you don't throw her in it was lanagan he had whirled from the huddled form to send the words cutting through the air at harrigan like a whiplash the girl flung up a white face in a swift look of wild hope i don't know anything mr lanagan don't let him put me in jail she threw herself from her chair in an attempt to clasp his arm but her withered and shrunken limb crumpled under her and she sank to the floor with a sharp cry of pain lanagan leaned and lifted her to the chair harrigan had an ugly look as he measured the distance from himself to lanagan yes harrigan you rotten thief clodhopper is too mild for you you bum said harrigan with deadly levelness you drunken bum lanagan's leap was cat-like it took all the mighty o'rourke's strength to tear his fingers free lanagan was not a queensbury fighter when tackling two hundred pounds of policemen o'rourke had harrigan by the arms thomas had lanagan for a second or two there was not a sound but the panting of grappling men then discipline told harrigan's arms relaxed you are relieved from duty officer harrigan said o'rourke until i lay the matter of your insubordination before the chief the detective turned on his heel and walked from the room stopping at the door i'll get you lanagan he said lanagan ignored him now jack said o'rourke grimly as thomas freed the reporter why won't we throw this girl in because said lanagan still breathing heavily she is innocent how do you know i know that is enough if you won't take my word ring up the chief and he will o'rourke knew the close friendship between lanagan and chief leslie and the confidence the chief had in his judgment 
he gazed doubtfully at the girl and then at robbins secretly he respected lanagan also and he was impressed by lanagan's assurance we aren't justified in holding the girl he said to robbins then to lanagan all right you win but as lanagan left the room with the girl to send her home in the police automobile o'rourke had an afterthought he turned to thomas we might just as well cover up watch the house to-night there's something queer about this whole business that i don't get yet whatever happens keep calm until i see you again was lanagan's last counsel to the girl through the scene in o'rourke's office she had kept crouched down in her chair watching with wide eyes save for one quickly shrilled give it to him as lanagan's sinewy fingers twined around harrigan's throat it was terrible of me to say that wasn't it she asked but i couldn't help it he is a bad man i feel it he's what we call a wrong detective said lanagan dryly don't think about him any more let me have norton he said some moments later to sampson and to me he said i want you to cover two eleven clementina street don't bother anybody just see who goes in or out or hangs around there i'll pick you up later down there wait for me no matter what happens he jumped into a taxicab at the curbing and whirled away out market street i hastened to my station in that gloomy narrow street of rookeries almost opposite to eleven was a deep doorway i flattened back in the shadows trusting to luck that the occupants were all in bed and that no one would walk up on me i was not bothered an hour passed and another i heard someone come out of a house a few doors above me and saunter down the street toward me i huddled back the figure passed within six feet of me by the dim rays of the gas lamp on the corner throwing its feeble area of light a dozen yards i recognized detective thomas he slipped into the side door of the corner saloon off his job whatever it is i said to myself something should happen now it usually does in such cases it did noiselessly on the opposite sidewalk passed a figure in a heavy black overcoat with a high collar turned up around the ears and a soft hat pulled down in front of two eleven the figure stopped for a fraction of a second it may have been to look for something that had been dropped but it appeared to me to fumble an instant by the steps the figure then passed rapidly on thomas a fresh cigar between his teeth sauntered back to his post the figure that had stopped at two eleven had disappeared around the corner at seventh street thomas had certainly missed the episode entirely there was a long interval the door at two eleven opened slowly a girl came out finally a girl with a crutch she came down the three steps looked up and down and across the street and suddenly dropped down and i could see that she was rummaging in the space under the stairs stepping easily i saw thomas his cigar still puffing leisurely cross the street he was almost beside the girl before she saw him there came a faint cry of alarm quickly smothered as she straightened up her back to the house i walked quickly to them in time to hear thomas voice well miss find any presents little late for santa claus isn't it ah well, let's see uh, let's just see what you were looking for under those stairs he dropped to his knees threw his pocket flash about and arose a small package wrapped in a newspaper in his hand the girl was staring with startled wide eyes she was breathing quickly her thin bosom rising and falling thomas wheeled on me was about to snap at me thought better of it and remarked oh well you're dropped to me i might as well let you in he tore off the paper wrapping from the package and in the flash of his pocket light i saw the glitter of a pair of diamond eardrops do you make them he asked triumphantly i nodded the jewels unquestionably answered the description of those stolen from the robin's home it came to me like a physical blow the shock that such a frail broken bit of humanity as the little back alley waif before me was entangled in a thieves gang i knew she was the suspect's sister she still held her defiant place against the house 
i guess this time young lady you will go in said thomas tersely do you want anything from the house got anything to say you are going to jail she began to tremble violently but her lips were still compressed no she managed to say at last no i was watching i know now i know but i will not talk to you please don't waken my mamma or my little brothers let us go now if i must she started to hobble away in feverish haste shaken with sobs that she would not permit to escape her lips seldom have i been affected with such a sense of sadness as came over me then all of the tragedy that would have been in the situation with even a whole girl under such circumstances was doubled by her condition got her dead to rights that time chuckled thomas to me she'll spill now sure the rest of the stuff must be cached around here somewhere you think there is uh, no question about the ward boy i asked not the slightest and she is in and is covering up they're all crooked these back alley rats there's more in the gang of course that stuff was put there i suppose to-night for her to shove probably she peddles it you never can tell how these gangs operate i glanced again at the pitiable little misshapen thing dragged away from her home to a cell and an iron bed at the city prison and i couldn't trust myself to reply to thomas by a curious change that is gradually making me less valuable as a newspaper man the older i become in the business i find myself unconsciously taking sides against my paper with fellow beings whose frailties or sorrows make them grist for the newspaper mill i felt so toward this poor little girl now a victim of congenital influence in all likelihood obviously a product of the malnutrition of the under classes thomas took his prisoner away in a taxi and i hurried to a telephone and gave the story to sampson in that fashion i then hastened back to clementina street where to my great relief i was picked up by lanagan within a few moments i related everything to him when i had finished his eyes shone more brightly than the gas jet over our heads never had i beheld him so far from the composure for which he was noted for a minute or two he anathematized o'rourke by all the carded oaths and a few that he invented back back in jail is she so o'rourke couldn't take my word we'll see oh we'll see wait he ran up the steps to two eleven after a long period the door opened it was the mother briefly lanagan explained what had happened the poor old toothless soul was about past being shocked further but quickly lanagan in that compelling way of his calmed her fears he promised that she would have her son and daughter back before daylight before daylight it fairly took my breath away what is it jack give me a line i demanded in excitement heavens man it's a quarter to two how are you going to get a story in the paper to-night now you'll only break it for all the papers lanagan stopped short in his rapid walk and laid his hand on my shoulders i've been in this game fifteen years norrie he said with a solemnity new in him let me tell you something and i say it who have the right there comes a time just once every so often when a newspaper man puts humanity above his paper remember that you are betraying no trust with your paper when you do you are betraying your trust with yourself with your fellow man and with your conscience when you do not this is one of them that was all but many times in the years that have whirled by since then and since that strange marvellous man passed out of the newspaper life of the west have those words come back out of the dark of a back alley to guide me he was not working for an exclusive now he was working to free a mite of a crippled girl and her stunned and misused brother from the inner tier of cells at the city prison he said no more at market street he flung open a taxicab door and we jumped in he called an address to the driver it was chief leslie's home we were there within fifteen minutes lanagan held his finger on the button until the door swung open and the chief himself appeared wrapped in a lounging robe his hair tousled his beard rumpled but his gray eyes wide and alert lanagan brushed in and i after him 
he sat the chief down on a settee and for ten minutes he hammered away at last leslie's fist banged the settee arm by the lord harry you're right and i want to flash that bird again it all comes back to me now i couldn't make out the other day where i had seen him before little stouter but same man or i'll cut my throat he took the stairs to the next floor three at a time within five minutes he was back fully dressed got your machine out here yet yes said lanagan but don't forget the wards leslie stepped to the telephone stand and to his private line to headquarters prison he said shortly prison give me the matron mrs connis take that ward girl into your room and give her the best you have until i get down give me andrews sergeant andrews take that ward boy to the matron's room and give him the best you have until i get down there he's hung up the receiver come on we'll pick up brady he lives just around the corner we better get maloney too he's not far away if this is the bird i think it is we'll take no chances known as the swallow two-timer moyomasing prison porch climber came out here about fifteen years ago and reported on saying he wanted a chance to make good we kept track of him for a couple of years he was clerking and doing the right thing and then we lost him i didn't identify him that closely said lanagan but he's the man who did this trick and the other nine within twenty-five minutes brady and maloney were crowded into the machine with us lanagan gave a direction at pacific avenue and octavia street we stopped in the heart of the fashionable western edition with lanagan and leslie in the lead brady and i next and maloney bringing up the rear we straggled along for several blocks at washington and buchanan streets the chief and lanagan had stepped back and signalled us we closed up from the middle of the block on washington street came the sound of a taxicab starting leslie looked around the corner as the machine came towards us and stepped to the street flashing his shield the machine stopped the door opened a head appeared a familiar voice came hello chief what's up detective harrigan stepped out you're up said leslie with a bitter oath you are under arrest brady search the prisoner quick as a knife blade springs back harrigan's hand went to his hip but as quick as he was leslie was quicker there was a click click and harrigan stood before his superior officer and his brother detectives manacled with practised fingers brady was running through his clothes he passed over harrigan's revolver handcuffs and billy he brought forth a leather wallet leslie tore it open it held an assortment of jewellery jumbled together so he said his voice shaking with rage you knew it was a swallow did you and you have been shaking him down for half the loot well officer harrigan you and the swallow will be splitting cobblestones inside of a month you dirty rotten gutter scut you were framing to send two little kids to prison were you i wish i'd let you pull that gun we'd have saved the county the expense of a trial he tore harrigan's coat back and ripped his star from his breast he ground it under his heel until the number it held was obliterated and then he hurled it spinning into the air and over the corner house it landed faintly on a distant roof harrigan noticed lanagan for the first time and sprang for him raising his manacled hands but leslie stopped him with a drive to the jaw that sent him staggering back against the machine take him in maloney ordered the chief i've seen enough of him we'll get along without you now harrigan said not a word he stumbled into the machine maloney following it drove away jack lanagan said leslie i wish you were on my staff you could have o'rourke's job tonight. thanks chief i'll be satisfied if you send o'rourke to the fog belt replied lanagan sardonically put a man like royan in his place and you'll have the kind of head the bureau needs royan goes said the chief you're entitled to something on this night's work we've got to hurry our man may have noticed that taxi incident i don't think so harrigan came out of the house we walked up the street take the rear brady said leslie and the detective stepped quietly down the cement path at the side of a fairly pretentious home leslie lanagan and i tiptoed up the front steps we stood to one side while lanagan took the door 
he rang twice footsteps came it was evident harrigan's host had not yet retired that you harrigan the voice came from inside before the door opened lanagan mumbled a yes the door swung back and donald cutting esq proprietor and general manager of the phoenix vacuum cleaning company stood staring at lanagan from the brilliantly lighted hallway for an instant he was speechless then he shouted well what the devil do you want around here at this hour of the morning what gets into you reporters anyhow has a citizen got any rights in his own home at all there aren't many that you have it was leslie he had swung to the door directly before cutting his revolver was at cutting's waist just keep your hands a little higher cutting you're pretty nifty with those digits of yours now back in there so we can all sit down and talk cutting stood an instant as though frozen and then mechanically stepped back we all walked in the door was closed swallow said the chief you're through we've got harrigan with the goods where's the rest of the loot i mean outside the robin stuff we've got that located cutting's head dropped to his hands he sat in silence bowed donald what is it is there any trouble a woman's voice came over the balustrade he straightened up as though an electric current had shot through him nothing molly he said just some old friends dropped in on me i will be at liberty soon your wife asked leslie my wife replied cutting in another moment she was sweeping from the broad stairway in a silken kimono her hair flowing loosely and stood before us cutting looked directly at her and in her eyes there was a light of questioning i must leave you molly he said still looking at him in that singular way she asked for how long it is not in my power to say these men are police officers they knew me from the east they want me to go down to the jail with them will you be there long if i could help myself i would not go at all oh she said with a nervous laugh i understand something possibly about that poor boy in your employ and that robbery lanagan's black eyes were studying the woman intently leslie was watching cutting both i could see were puzzled even i with my duller perceptions was sensible that there was some subtle undercurrent in this conversation something cryptic that i could not solve you will need your hat she said and turned to the hat rack in the rear of the hall it's all right chief said cutting in an aside arising you've got me please don't make any scene before her she returned with the hat and he fumbled with it kiss me he said she did so left his arms but came back to them a gush of tears starting as she clung to him in a passionate embrace go he said faintly his voice breaking she turned and stumbled for the stairs a quick look flashed from lanagan to the chief one minute madam said leslie sternly you had better come along too no cried cutting never chief as you are a man never in a million years she has never known of my work out here she knew me before my amazing she stuck by me during it all she married me and we came out here she knows nothing nothing she may have suspected but she knew nothing the old call claimed me going through those houses making estimates on cleaning why it's a disease that's all chief i got pressed for money i undertook too much in my business i couldn't handle it i had notes to meet i just fell naturally back to the old easy way that's all just went back to it because that's the way i was born i suppose crooked humph where did you send the stuff east except the robins and needed money bad didn't want to take a chance handling it here so i tried the message what harrigan didn't get is down at the office in the safe well, we suspected that said leslie how long has harrigan been cutting with you oh well uh, don't ask me that some time he's a wolf i am a crook but he's got me lashed to the mast the kid stuff was none of mine i did lose one ring at the office the boy found it he got scared and contradicted himself harrigan framed the other thing about the house well, i guess it's pretty nearly an even break said leslie he stepped forward to put on the wrist nippers as he did so cutting raised his hat to his head 
his hand coming down stopped for a fraction of a second at his lips better this he said rapidly backing away i couldn't go back i'm a pretty old man you know as though he had been shot through the heart he dropped in a heap lanagan leaped for him the chief bent over him they arose together lanagan picked up the hat and turned back the sweatpan inside was a little envelope pasted to the felt it was half filled with white powder cyanide said lanagan such was the passing of the swallow lanagan in his search for similar conditions in the ten burglaries found but one that cutting had personally visited each house to make the estimates of cost that fact coupled with the ring found at his establishment convinced lanagan that he and he alone was the man cutting worked four machines each with its separate crew and no other employee had worked in more than three out of the ten houses anxious to keep track of cutting after his theory began to impress him he had learned that he was at the theatre he had picked him up after the show trailed him to a cafe followed him in a taxicab as he took his wife home and kept at his tail lights when he returned after one o'clock to discharge the machine and walk to a saloon well south of market street where he had met harrigan that was lanagan's first definite information that harrigan and cutting were involved cutting and harrigan had separated lanagan following cutting to his establishment he remained there some time busied about his safe and then apparently gone directly home it was then that lanagan picked me up harrigan of course was the man who had passed through the alley he then had gone on out to cutting's house for a final distribution of the spoils cutting having evidently taken harrigan's share from the safe late that same afternoon lanagan sat in leslie's office with robbins who had just received his jewelry robbins drew out his checkbook if you will permit me he said to lanagan he had filled in two hundred and fifty dollars how do you spell your name lanagan laughed make it out to the adams piano company he said robbins looked politely inquisitive but asked no questions he wrote in the name but leslie was not so polite what in the name of sam hill are you going to do with a piano nothing myself i wouldn't take it any more than i would take the money you know that but there is a girl i know who can use that piano and use it to very good advantage and what's more she's entitled to it he picked up the check and carefully folded it placing it in his pocket i'm going over now and pick out the best piano the money will buy he said and i'm going to send it with the compliments of mr robbins chief leslie and jack lanagan to a little home at two eleven clementina street miss ward is the name he lit a match end of story nine Story 10 of Lanagan, Amateur Detective, by Edward H. Hurlbut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 10, Out of the Depths. The Stockslager case will be recalled immediately upon the Pacific coast as a crime of some years ago marked by the peculiar atrocity of the circumstances aged mrs Doxlager, living in a small cottage at the extreme northern end of thirty-third avenue in those days a region sparsely settled and visited chiefly by picnickers bound for baker's beach was found one sunday morning literally hacked to pieces from the location of portions of the dismembered body it was apparent that the author had planned to carry the evidences of the crime away and sink them in the waters of the ocean which tumbled and rolled on the rocks at the base of the steep cliff that marked the extremity of thirty-third avenue a potato sack with the torso was found near the rear door to the cottage indicating that whoever had committed the deed had probably been interrupted while carrying the remains to the bay and had then fled a kitchen butcher knife was the weapon used robbery was evidently the motive for the hut had been ransacked thoroughly such poor and mean trinkets as the recluse was known to possess having been taken mrs stockslager did a small business in sandwiches popcorn and soda-water with the picnickers 
the rumours of a miser's hoard that usually attached to such as she had long been current but whether the slayer or slayers realised a profit in money could not be determined as there was no one who could be found sufficiently familiar with her life to say whether she did or did not have a store of money on the premises such were the general facts which sampson city editor of the inquirer skeletonized tersely to lanagan as that police reporter of superior talents reported for duty after a lapse of more than ordinary duration hop to it jack added sampson you've had your salary for two weeks show your appreciation those were the days before automobiles might be requisitioned uh, occasionally for big assignments and lanagan taking the steam line that in those days twisted around the ocean shore was considerably later than the coroner's deputies who had already discharged their functions and now were engaged in making an impromptu meal upon the old woman's supply of sandwiches the only loot available phillips and castle special duty men from the golden gate park police station were also on the scene the upper office at headquarters is recruited where it is not recruited by politics or favoritism by these active young officers on special duty at the outside stations and lanagan knew that this particular brace of plainclothes men were hard-working and ambitious and without the strings that many times bring the ablest of upper office men a trifle too considerately into touch with the outlaw clans what do you make of it phillips asked lanagan as the officer placed his notebook in his pocket wouldn't call it a suicide exactly replied phillips offishly lanagan laughed no he drawled i wouldn't put it past you to call it natural causes though phillips flushed to the base of his thick neck but held himself from answering he knew lanagan by reputation and did not care to match wits with him lanagan worked with most of the upper office men on intimate terms but found it occasionally necessary to put a crimp in the arrogance or ignorance of the outside station officers who do not come into contact with newspaper men as frequently as the downtown men and at times elect to affect the same impartiality with which they treat ordinary persons such lanagan took pride in bringing to a proper appreciation of the honourable place occupied by the brothers of the tribe lanagan ignored the two detectives and gave his attention to the coroner's deputies the cottage and outskirts and the contents of the wicker basket before the next train arrived bringing a dozen reporters and cameramen from the other papers and myself lanagan had finished his investigations i found him seated on a salt grass hummock smoking and gazing absently up and down the rugged rocky shoreline the surf was tumbling heavily although a few hundred yards out the sea was an undulating swell of greenish beauty some fine day was his greeting let's take a stroll down we made our way down the cliff to the rocks at the water's edge imagination is oftentimes a great thing in solving crime he remarked as he poised himself perilously on a slippery rock and relit his cigar that and the take a chance instinct call it a hunch bull luck accident or as one great french detective said le grand hasard beautiful picture is it not he pointed toward the heads where a pacific mail steamship was just putting her pilot down the side she made a fine picture in truth with her clean lithe lines and her smoke blowing back like the wind-blown tresses of a girl we strolled along the intermittent stretches of sandy beach or clambered over the rocks and it finally struck me that lanagan's ferret eyes were not at all absent-minded or entirely busied with the natural beauties of the scene but that he was examining closely every square inch of the ground we travelled and the waters as we passed phillips is rather cagey he remarked he'll have to be taught his place he's a good officer though and leslie has his eye on him we must look out for that chap he not only has good legs a prime requisite of a detective or a reporter but he has a head that really works once in a while he sat down finally under the shelter of a great rock and motioned me to do likewise 
then he pulled from his pocket carefully tucked away a v-shaped piece of paper written over with chinese characters the corner that made the apex of the v was crinkled what do you make of it it's a piece of a chinese newspaper i replied really you could do credit to phillips examine it this time i tried again but could make nothing of it look he uncrumpled the slight crinkling at the apex and a tiny bit of red paper was exposed i was ashamed of my own lack of observation but just as puzzled as before and said so i should say said lanagan that this paper with the chinese characters was a piece of wrapping paper that someone tore it from a package with his fingernails and that a portion of the red wrapper of the package itself came off in his fingernails see he crumpled it up and sure enough it fitted neatly into the space under his fingernail well i asked vaguely then i had an inspiration the chinese burial ground was only an eighth of a mile away lanagan obviously had some theory connecting chinese with the crime the bit of paper evidently having dropped from a chinaman's blouse i told him so he laughed immoderately but indulgently and carefully put the bit of paper away in his pocket you're a stemwinder when it comes to writing fancy leads for my police stories he said still chuckling but i guess i'll have to give up for keeps trying to make a detective out of you i have shown you in perspective as it were during the past twenty minutes the solution of this entire crime if my theory is not altogether wrong and you can't see it let's get busy your legs can at least be a service to me i want you to stick around here for a couple of hours tackle everybody in sight for a knowledge of mrs stockslager how long she has been out here her past who her family are if any who her visitors have been if she had any particular idiosyncrasies or hobbies take in all the houses within a radius of a mile there are only four or five and try to get some kind of a line on her don't overlook the small boy in out-of-the-way regions like this he is the pioneer of civilization and you may tumble on to more through some roving urchin than all the grown-ups in the county i will leave instructions at the office where to meet me later i anticipate lively entertainment ahead when we got back to the cottage the coroner's deputies had gone as had phillips and castle cameramen were taking the house from many angles artists were busy sketching the interior that was the heyday of yellow journalism marking the spot with the old familiar cross reporters were still cluttered around a crowd of morbid persons attracted out of the very sky like vultures were already gathered suppose you've already got it all cleared remarked bradley of the times to lanagan he was lanagan's nearest approach to a rival as a police reporter clear as print can make it replied lanagan as he turned for the train he ran for the car leaving bradley secretly uneasy he had a wholesome regard for lanagan and knew that he was of few words and not given to wasting them i slipped the rest of the newspaper men and tramped the sand hills covering all of the houses buzzing an occasional small boy the best i could get for two hours hard work and the first tip came from an unwashed sling-shooting young american was a vague story that no one could substantiate that mrs stockslager had a worthless son who infrequently visited her for money i hugged this information close until i could see lanagan it so happened he ordered me to keep it quiet for that day giving no reasons i was chagrined the next morning to awaken and find that bradley had the same piece of information and had flashed it on the front page for an exclusive double-leaded feature to his story the search then turned to the sun he could be traced to within six or seven months of the murder i had to lumber along as best i could in handling the story without lanagan's assistance the stories in all the newspapers became monotonously uniform on the third day the interest was thinning there had not been a single new fact discovered nor so far as the inquirer was concerned had there been a word from lanagan he must have something sampson said to me irritably on the third day but take a flyer through his hangouts on the chance that he might have gone off again 
i shook my head that isn't lanagan with a story on i said he does his drinking when the story is turned in nevertheless i took a quick skirmish to connor's fogarty's and red murphy's and looked up kid monahan and some of lanagan's intimates in the upper office i could find no trace of him toward evening i dropped back to the inquirer after a final round-up of the ends of the story at police headquarters and there lanagan sat with his heels on sampson's desk with that pulseless individual shooting questions at him with the speed and precision of an automatic revolver i've given you all that i am free to give just now said lanagan shutting down on the questioning you've got a good enough scoop to hold the story for to-morrow let me handle the rest in my own way will you he was nettled don't be so didactic do you think i've been spending the last three days with a dry nurse he was the only man on the inquirer who could take that tone with sampson and hold his job no i know you've been on your toes hard jack and i appreciate it only the news call gets the best of me and this story has us all on edge replied sampson you're not to go near the prison continued lanagan i need norton to-night let martin write the story from here stockslager is absolutely out of it he has been a trustee at the city prison for about six months which clears him up name he goes under is swede stockley the police have known it all along but they have kept it dark for certain reasons which i am not at liberty now to state lend me that nice new mackintosh of your sampson it's raining like blazes and the enthusiastic mr norton and myself will have a hard stand to-night take your raincoat norton we are going out looking for ghosts around the stockslager cottage there's a real ghost of the old lady out there and i've wanted for a long time to have a run-in with a genuine spook she was seen on the cliff last night as the train stopped mccluskey the conductor thought he heard a sort of moaning he's a pretty nervy chap and the moans uh, coming it seemed from the hut didn't scare him much he walked over that way and silhouetted at the edge of the cliff he swears he saw the old lady herself it was too much even for mccluskey and he ran back to the train he and the engineer roberts went back with a couple of crowbars although he didn't say what good crowbars would do in tackling a bona fide ghost they just got one glimpse of the thing and it disappeared and they both swear it couldn't have had time to get any place before they reached the scene it was a fairly clear night during a break in the storm and they wasted five minutes and then went back to their train i was out there to-day and mccluskey told me the yarn they've kept it quiet around the car barn for fear of being ridiculed i have them pledged to secrecy don't use that angle of the story to-morrow though as i want to do some ghost hunting before the whole town hears about it and flocks out there come on norrie got your gun that ghost talk gave me all sorts of forebodings with a black night ahead and a driving rain ghost hunting on the scene of the murder in an environment sufficiently forbidding on a wintry night in any event failed to stir me to any particular height of enthusiasm fire ahead said sampson with one of his mirthless grins but he was sitting comfortably in a steam-heated office it was nine o'clock when we boarded the steam cars at the old central avenue terminal mccluskey was a solid-jawed sensible self-reliant looking chap it puzzled me a sober steady man like that must have seen something very convincing before sponsoring talk of ghosts ghost hunting he asked yes replied lanagan good feature story this ghost stuff keep it quiet for a day or two longer will you sure i'll be on the watch for the inquirer to see about it looked for it to-night but didn't see it he slowed down for us about an eighth of a mile from the thirty-third avenue stop and we dropped off into a bitter rain that rain would have quenched the tail fires of hell we struggled on heads down there was no use in trying to talk and i knew lanagan would take his own time about giving me any information we suddenly pulled stiffly up against two bulky rain-coated figures a dark lantern flashed first in my face and then in lanagan's well well it was lanagan's ready voice pitched a trifle high on account of the beating rain if it isn't messrs phillips and castle walking to reduce weight i presume what are you fellows doing out here asked philip gruffly 
well philip seeing that it's you i'll tell you it's none of your business maybe we're going to swim to the phalarones do you understand me perfectly isn't it we'll see and i don't know whether we want you snuffing around here or not replied phillips he was a choleric man was phillips with a neck too thick even for a policeman i thought for a moment lanagan would have us both ordered back but he only laughed in that mocking machiavellian laugh of his that could rasp like a file on a sore tooth dear me he said your mood fits the weather phillips very disagreeable i am not concerned with your wants i'm going to snuff to my heart's content now please step off the right away and permit us to pass we are both citizens of this great and glorious city that overpays you most disgracefully in proportion to your attainments and as such citizens our powers and privileges on the county domain are precisely as full and complete as yours phillips you'll never do no policeman ever succeeds who begins by antagonizing newspaper men i'm telling you you won't do step aside please we want to go on and we don't purpose to walk around you to do it for a moment things looked ugly with phillips standing fast castle took him by the arm come on tom you're wrong he said and the two officers stepped to one side and we passed on with lanagan chuckling aloud ghost hunting is becoming a regular fad he said finally and i shouldn't be surprised to find a few more hunters scattered around we will let phillips and castle pass we stepped quickly to one side and sank down behind a hillock of very wet and very cold sand lanagan was correct the two detectives had turned and followed us they went on ahead having missed us it was shivery here were four men two trailing two others who assumed they were the trailers and all bound for a murder house on a black night to hunt ghosts for it was safe to assume that in some fashion phillips and castle had heard the ghost episode did we but know it at the time we were in turn being trailed by two keen-eyed storm-coated men each of whom kept a steady hand in his overcoat pocket for as phillips and castle disappeared on ahead and we were just stepping back to the railroad tracks from our place of concealment lanagan suddenly bore back and stopped i followed suit more ghost hunters he whispered in my ear pointing two blurred indistinct figures passed along the right-of-way it was awesome but lanagan gave me no time for questions stooping low threshing softly through the dripping salt grass in and out among the sand dunes we worked our way gradually toward the cliffs along the ocean the coat fairly well protected my body but my shoes were soaked and i was drenched with the cold numbing rain to my knees in a position i should judge about twenty yards from the point where the path from the stockslagger's path led over the cliff to the rocks below we crouched against a hummock the ocean roared beneath us and the white froth of the breakers tumbling on the rocks could be faintly seen each time it would flash into the corner of my eye i thought it was a ghost time i don't believe in ghosts of course but under such circumstances one can't help wondering a little bit from behind us as we lay there once twice thrice four times we heard the toot toot of the train and i knew that we had lain there for two mortal hours because the train made hourly round trips i thought of samson and his snug office and his snug salary and i compared myself taking the chances of anything from a pistol ball to pneumonia for my thirty dollars a week i concluded to quit the business at the end of this scrape but i always determined to do that under such circumstances so does every newspaper man and they always show up for work the next day were we not at least potential paranoiacs we wouldn't be newspaper men certainly otherwise we wouldn't do the things we do for the pay we get regarding newspaper photographers there is no question they are all crazy oh, except one we had drunk the last drop from the healthy flask apiece we had brought and i was settling back in soggy misery for more suffering my eyes so blurred with watching and staring that i could see slinking forms in fancy every place i turned when lanagan's lean hand clutched my leg 
he had taken a position lower and nearer the path than i and could get a dim perspective of the edge of the cliff just where the path descended i peered ahead faintly i could see a single figure outlined in blurred relief and then it disappeared apparently into thin air whether it was man or woman i could not have told that it disappeared before my eyes i knew it gave one a creepy feeling i was about to speak to lanagan but his warning pressure was still on my calf probably thirty minutes passed or it may have been only three another figure came into view and then another and disappeared then i realized that the first figure had simply slipped down the path and out of sight i wondered if something of the sort hadn't happened when mccluskey was ghost hunting still lanagan held that vice-like clutch on me another prolonged interval two more figures bulked into view and disappeared many more minutes passed and lanagan said no word the wind during the hours had died away but the rain continued pelting now straight down lanagan's hand finally loosened itself from my leg he pointed over the ocean toward the intermittent flashes of the lighthouse at land's end between the land's end and fort point lights could be seen the lights of a vessel she's a day overdue on account of the storm lanagan shot up at me she's heading through the golden gate now we'll have some fun shortly i reckon he straightened up and stretched himself and i did likewise threshing my arms to start the blood into circulation i was cold cramped and grouchy jack i said impatiently cut out this mystery stuff and give me the facts you've got me neck and neck with pneumonia now kick through with this story whatever it is or i'm going to tear down that cliff after those fellows and start something if only to keep warm of course he only laughed the man must have been made of chilled steel easy norrie think of the ten cents car fare you can charge up on this assignment that ought to be some compensation that and the glory of the thing even if you do get sciatica or lumbago or some other old woman's complaint norrie sometimes you make me weary here i'm staging one of the finest climaxes you have ever participated in i have adopted a true shakespearean method of suiting the natural surroundings to the action it's rather an epic situation in my opinion now that liner it was the mail-boat hong kong has finally passed inside the gate any minute something may happen and i pick you out of the entire staff to be here when it does happen here in an elemental atmosphere where human lives may be snuffed out as we snuffed out the contents of those flasks and still you're not satisfied it's a big vital gripping situation where's your imagination oh hell you're drunk let's chase down after those men let's do something to start things whatever they may be i'm cold lanagan was genuinely put out with me later i knew why he had been hanging around these bleak cliffs for two nights and skulking in the sand dunes for two days watching the stockslager hut no wonder i was a quitter by comparison he whirled on me and i saw his eyes flashing with that curious light that i had seen in them on rare occasions when he was thoroughly aroused you either quit whining or beat it back to town if he had struck me in the face it couldn't have affected me differently such was the magnetism of that remarkable man i beg your pardon jack i didn't mean to rough you i said and he was his natural self in a moment too all right forget it let's take a peek over the cliff we crawled to the edge of the path lanagan was ahead he was on his feet with a leap the instant he struck the ledge and i up beside him ha he shouted they're at it now we'll see now we'll see le grand hassad far down below i saw a half a dozen flares in the darkness smattered smeared flares of yellowish light and then all was blackness again there came no report from weapons the roaring of the surf drowning that more by instinct than anything else to be on the scene of action i made a quick step toward the path lanagan's hand was on my arm wait he said curtly this is no funeral of ours wait he knelt down arching his hands around his eyes and peering long and intently 
revenue officers he said we can't monkey with them haven't got them in my staff like leslie and his men they'll be up revenue officers a light began to dawn upon me the toot toot of the engine came beat it norrie hold that train ordered lanagan there may be some wounded here to rush to town quick i was already off on the run past the stockslager hut to the little platform where the train stopped it was some distance away around the curve as i stood there with the rain pattering a monotonous tattoo on the planking there came a sudden groan a drawn-out rasping groan and i whirled toward the house my body one quiver of goose flesh it came again from up toward the roof and as it came there was a breathing of light wind across my face i laughed aloud but nervously another light puff of wind another long-drawn groan loose shingles or a loose piece of clapboarding giving evidently just the slightest against a nail the other end of the ghost mystery was cleared the train pulled in i told mccluskey there had been a shooting and to hold the train can't back her in we'll run out to the first switch he cried as he jumped into the cab with the engineer i ran back to find four men bearing a form between them lanagan was alongside the leader of the four talking swiftly they kicked in the door of the hut and made a light on the floor littered just as it had been littered the sunday morning of the murder discovery they placed the figure they bore a stalwart figure of a man a leg and an arm i could see were useless they felt of his arm and leg and he never winced staring straight at the ceiling they ripped away his oilskin coat his overshirt and undershirt he had a bullet just over the heart a deep wound and one that bled inwardly for no blood oozed out two of the four men had deposited on the floor bulky bundles wrapped in rubber around which double pairs of life preservers were strapped he who seemed to be the leader of the four marshall a chief revenue inspector lanagan whispered to me took the man's pulse after the examination was ended no one had spoken in the faces of all as far as i could detect in the murky light of the smoky chimney of an oil lamp was a set grim look not the look that officers usually wear when there has been a killing or a successful capture on a crime marshall straightened up he said solemnly billy i think you are going what have you got to say any message no jim said the man on the floor weakly you got me right i went into the thing with my eyes open only don't ask me to squeal on the others i got what i deserved i guess i've brought shame to the service and i'm ready to pass thank god thank god he burst out with sudden choking the wife is not here passed out last year you know and there never were any kiddies no one to suffer but you boys that i've disgraced a tear rolled from his eyes to the floor can i say a word to him marshal it was lanagan who spoke the other men had bowed their heads on one or two faces i could see a tear for all the wetness that the rain had left there in right said lanagan kneeling down beside the stricken man you know you are passing make a clean breast who killed mrs stocklager his eyes closed and he seemed to shrink as though trying to hug the floor he was lying upon whiskey came lanagan's sharp whisper unconsciously he was taking command of the situation asserting his natural leadership as he always did in tense moments marshall passed him a pocket flask and he forced a sip to enright's lips holding his head up with his left arm the eyes opened i did oh god billy no no not that not that it was marshall he broke down and sobbed like a boy twenty-five years he had been in the federal blue with billy enright one in the revenue the other in the custom service yes i did jim get me a priest don't let me die like this for old time's sake jim the train was whistling on its return we're taking you right in said lanagan smoothly we'll have a priest for you why did you kill her enright motioned for the flask with his free arm lanagan gave him a long pull for a time at least his voice was stronger she was threatening to tip off the gang she used to work with us she was well paid she didn't know i was in the service she found it out some way i came out one day to talk over with her about her threats i'd been drinking worrying over fear of exposure 
she wouldn't listen to reason she was a wolf she goaded me crazy i guess she taunted me about being a traitor to the country i served well i lost my head i grabbed the butcher knife and killed her so help me god as i am about to die that's the truth the eyes closed for a space and then he continued i stuck a few things in my pockets to make it look like robbery then i started to cut up the body to pack it in a sack and bury it or drop it over the cliff i weakened and dropped it outside the door and ran it was dark but i ran for miles around over the sand hills and it seemed she was always right after me it was awful i got my wits back later i saw the police and the papers were after the sun i felt easier there was a big shipment coming in on the hong kong forty thousand dollars all told no one would come out here and take a chance landing it afraid the police were watching the house i volunteered i figured if anyone saw me nosing around i could give them the inspector talk i hung around last night but the ship was held away out on account of the storm i had to come out again tonight that's all boys the door flung open and through it came phillips and castle mccluskey and roberts followed the train had stopped unnoticed so tense was the interest within the hut in the dying man's recital quick take him up said lanagan they stooped to lift him here what's all this it was phillips stand aside came marshall's blunt command it was obeyed enright's eyes had closed he was made as comfortable as possible with cushions on the train as that ancient rattle-trap strained and tugged to make the greatest speed of its history enright's eyes did not open on the trip in they never opened again lanagan filled in for me the details of the story the bit of red paper crinkled inside the paper with the chinese characters meant but one thing opium here was where his wide acquaintance with the underworld and chinatown the custom service and the waterfront aided him puzzling over the presence of an opium wrapping in that isolated hut lanagan had seated himself upon the salt grass hummock to smoke into his field of vision steamed the pacific mail liner and his hunch came with it his examination of the shore followed to locate a cove that would give a safe place to float the opium to land from a launch or whitehall boat by day or night such a cove he had found where the waters for a sixteenth of a mile deposited their driftwood his theory was complete the hut was a smuggler's runway the woman was in the ring and for a breach of faith had been slain an attempt being made to have it appear she was slain by robbers that marshall and his men had been preparing to close in on the gang that made the cabin their rendezvous lanagan did not know until the night before then i found the whole map out here sprinkled with them recognized marshall who nearly stumbled over me but he probably figured i was one of his men and said nothing it was funny mccluskey and roberts chasing ghosts with myself and four revenue officers as the audience i nearly laughed when mccluskey told me the story this morning they didn't come within fifteen yards of the edge of the cliff either although they said they did the weatherman told me today the storm would blow over by evening and i figured the hong kong would be making port and the ring would attempt to land their stuff every liner has been bringing it in i came out last night on the chance she might try to make port no one suspected enright it was a quarter to one o'clock when the train pulled into the depot marshall turned the body over to phillips and castle with a terse resume of the facts and then took his men and his bundles of opium and disappeared they laid enright out on a bench to await the coroner's deputies phillips came over to us i guess i act a kind of stiff he said in awkward apology but i want to hand it to you you scored on us strong lanagan put out his hand the detective took it you'll never make any mistake treating newspaper men right phillips just do this much for us now will you hold off thirty minutes before you telephone the morgue that will keep the story exclusively for the inquirer i'll do it said phillips and he did 
which may seem to the layman a little thing but to the newspaper man a detail of vast importance because it enabled lanagan sending the story to the office by telephone to score once again in sensational manner over his contemporaries the times and the herald end of story end of lanagan amateur detective by edward h hurlbut